How is AI transforming the content that we consume every single day on the web? And what role does human creativity still play in this evolving landscape? Well, today I'm joined by Nick Gernert, CEO of WordPress VIP, which is a platform that powers some of the world's top digital experiences. So today we're going to explore how AI is reshaping content creation, the balance between automation and human editorial judgment, and how data-driven insights are guiding the future of web content. But what does this mean for businesses and content creators striving to stay ahead in this rapidly changing digital environment? These are just a few of the things that me and Nick are going to tackle today. Before we welcome our guest onto the podcast today, though, delivering daily content to 140,000 of you wonderful monthly listeners across the globe is no small feat. I don't want to take all the credit here because it wouldn't be possible without the backing of our dedicated sponsors and partners. I also want to shine a light on the fact that legacy managed file transfer tools are dated and lack the security that today's remote workforce often demands. And companies that continue relying on that outdated technology often are in danger of putting their sensitive data at risk. So in the world of secure file transfers, KiteWorks stands alone with their FedRAMP moderate authorised since 2017. It is now known as the gold standard in MFT security. And with yearly audits and continuous monitoring, KiteWorks doesn't just meet standards, it sets them. For example, if you need CMMC compliance, KiteWorks fast tracks your authorization, saving you both time and money. You can step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks today by visiting KiteWorks.com to get started. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. But now it's time to dive into today's fascinating conversation with my guest. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Florida where Nick's waiting to join us. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Nick. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do. Thanks for having me, Neil. Um, it's great to be here. So I'm Nick Gernert. I am the CEO of a company called WordPress VIP. The easiest way to, to really explain what it is that we do here at WordPress VIP is um, we take something that I think is widely known uh, as something uh, on the web, WordPress, um, and we are taking a lot of the ease of use and a lot of the great things that made it ubiquitous, powering half of the sites on the web today, um, but taking that and making that something that is um, purpose-built and intentional for large enterprises um, and really doing that at scale. So we spend a lot of time thinking about things around security, compliance, performance, um, and and really the demands of sort of the enterprise, but really trying to give them better software than you're typically used to getting in the enterprise side of things. So so that's me, and that's uh, a bit about what I get to do uh, all day, although there's a lot of nuance and detail behind that that we could dig into. And I'm curious, what's your origin story? Everyone has an origin story. So what was the, the journey and vision behind WordPress VIP, and what is it that sets it apart in this incredibly crowded content management area? Because you type in something like WordPress into Google, you're going to get a lot of results, right? So tell me a little bit more about that story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can we can get into it. It depends on how far you want to go back and how much time we've got, Neil. I can, yeah. uh, you'll learn quickly. I can go off on on some tangents. So um so the you know the the VIP thing um, it goes back quite so we're part of a broader organization called Automatic so we're really a yeah. subsidiary of a company called Automatic which was started in 2005 by the creator of WordPress one of the co-creator of WordPress Matt Mullenweg um, and so you've got an open source project and WordPress started in 2003 and then you've got Automatic that was started in 2005 as a for-profit business that was really, the hope was that it would fund the open source project um, and be something that could really create a thriving um, ecosystem around WordPress. But that took capital to really ensure that. So Automatic started then. Um, and a lot of it in the early days of Automatic was focused around how do you make it easier to just spin up WordPress websites um, and, and do that. So it was a... a a SaaS model in 2005. Um, and it's one of those things where it's be careful what you name things because you can imagine there was a plan page where it was like free might have been on one side and then VIP was on the other side of that plans continuum. And on that side, it just said, call us. And the intent was really like, hey, there's probably some larger brands or bigger 
Uh, you might have been a, a big blogger in those days, um, and you might have wanted some extra help with WordPress. And so, hey, we've got this thing called VIP. Um, we'll try to take care of you. So that was 2000, probably six or seven at that point. I joined up with Automatic in 2013 now. So it's about 11 years ago. And when I joined my background, my personal origin story is all on the agency side of things. Uh, um, I was a developer, a freelancer, went through college, freelancing websites for folks, all that into big, large agencies. So um, prior to joining Automatic, I was at um, part of a brand that was under the Omnicom Group umbrella. So one, um, you know, the major multi-billion dollar marketing uh, organization that, um, and uh, and part of what my mandate was, was uh, uh, to help standardize platforms across Omnicom's, um, you know, different businesses and how they worked with customers. As you can imagine, you might have 15 different ways to do a website or 50 different ways. Um, but one of the standard things we were seeing then was WordPress was being adopted. And it was being adopted in um uh, by very large companies very large organizations but they had no relationship with automatic um and at the time really there wasn't anything in the wordpress ecosystem that was really tailoring anything towards fortune 500 global 2000 large demanding enterprises um so when i came into automatic it was how can we take this thing vip which had grown organically as something that would help large users as they would um need it but more of a uh, more people coming to automatic than automatic going out to the world and saying, here, we've got this thing. Um, and how could we take that and be much more intentional about building a business around this? What would it take for us to really go after some of the biggest companies in the world? Um, which, you know, again, we can get into a lot of this, but it becomes a focus on what do you have to do at a platform level to really stand up to the demands of those organizations that can be big targets or have a lot of um, concerns around security, data privacy, data residency, et cetera. Um, how do you have sales and marketing teams that are used to a more of an enterprise go-to-market motion? How do you have customer success and support teams that can really dig in and support and meet the demands of large organizations? So that was a lot of what we ended up taking and building the VIP business around was, you know, WordPress, this thing that came up and through more of an individual to SMB um, adoption, um, very successful there. Um, we'd have to think about it fundamentally differently if we wanted to make it um, successful with these large um, organizations that we all know and love. And personally, I just have a certain amount of vanity around. I like to work with names that folks recognize. So when you can say something uh, to your neighbor around when they're asking, what is it you do? And you're like, well, have you ever been to the White House's website or something? And then you can say, you know, that's that's us uh, sort of thing. So uh, so we like to try to take those things. And uh, so anyway, that's just my personal vanity there in that. So that's I don't know. That's a bit of the origin. Let's we can dig in anywhere you want to on that stuff, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if we fast forward to 2024 and we're also 10 minutes into a tech podcast, there are two that two words are bigger than WordPress and also an acronym bigger than VIP. And of course, I'm talking about AI or artificial intelligence it's almost a law that i have to mention them in a podcast but <laughs> how are you leveraging ai to enhance this content creation process for your clients because it initially it had a bit of a mixed reaction from those in the industry but how do you see it and how are you leveraging it yeah i mean i would still say that things are a bit Things are mixed, although like I do think folks are, I mean, I, I, I think we've all appreciated like that this is, this is a technology shift that, that is here to stay. Um, so, um, and, but I think, you know, in reality, it's still very early days, right? We're still truly trying to understand. We do, we do this annual survey. Um, we call it's a report we put out called content matters. We go out to about a thousand different people and ask them a bunch of questions. And one of them was just like, what's your adoption right now on, on AI? Um, what, where have you adopted it? And like 52% of the respondents were still in a none. Um, like we have not adopted any as part of our business. And I think that points to maybe a part of the, um, of the, of the market that's still out there that's quite skeptical around, um, just what is the value and also, you know, uh, where does safety really align with the use of these technologies? And that could be brand safety. That could be a number of things around safety, but there is just this concern where probably half of the market is still very much being cautious about adoption in this space. And then folks like yourself and then folks like us that live in tech, we're like, look, this is exciting. This is new technology. This is a sea change. We want to try to drive forward adoption because we see this as potentially a superpower for um, individuals and organizations, et cetera. How do we really drive that forward? 
And so, um, so that's where we fall is like, how do we want to really try to bring that, um, to our customers? Um, a lot of this is we, I mean, I think about this personally on our business across a few, um, dimensions. Um, the first is just where do we help, um, our own customers in their everyday work, um, in doing these things. So, you know, part of our offering is we have a developer platform. Uh, we have, uh, the CMS aspect where content creators and writers live in. And so there's lots of opportunities across that. I think on the developer side, it's a well-worn path where, um, where AI is helping in code creation, um, and the overall management of code bases, et cetera. And a lot of that comes to bear for our customers there. On the editorial and content creation side, you've got to think we're working with some of the world's largest media organizations, for example. Uh, and, um, and there's a lot of hesitation around just what, um, what is responsible adoption of this technology. And also there's a lot of excitement for, um, adoption of this. I've got, um, one particular CTO in our customer base. I won't, um, give him up here necessarily, but he is just like, look, I'm telling everyone on my team, what is the new thing you did with AI today? Because if you haven't done something new with AI today, we're probably falling apart or falling behind as a business. So what are you doing? That's new. So that's the kind of person that we um, are excited about and thinking about technology adoption and the things that we're doing are where can we actually add, um, value, um, on in what is a very exciting, but also crowded space. There's 50 different ways for you to generate a headline. There's 50 different ways for you to generate a body of text and, and change the tone of it or any number of things that are novel, but, uh, at, but also when it comes to real world practice, how valuable are those things in this? And so we have been, uh, really focusing on where do we add unique value? So one of the things that is, I think, unique about where we sit in our platform, uh, we have a wealth of analytic, traditional web analytics type data that lives alongside of um, the content itself. And so we have an understanding of content performance and and historical performances and, and helping predict what might work well into the future on things. And so where we've been looking at and where we've been releasing um, capabilities unique to our platform around AI are really and how do we make how do we give editors and content creators superpowers um we want folks to be able to publish faster um and uh, more accurately um and more effectively um and so, and you could think like as an example like maybe a breaking news situation you would want to get something out fast because if you're fast out into market then you probably drive the um significant amount of eyeballs but also to be fast you might not set up links. Uh, you might not tag as well as you're supposed to. You might not do a lot of the editorial content creation checklist. You might make compromises on which images you select or any number of those things. And so that's where we're seeing AI can really help on these things in our content workflows, which is like, hey, let us help you on the linking aspects. Let us help you on content categorization of things. Um, let us help you on actually we're finding things in headline creation when we're using statistics uh, more than 70% of the time, the AI generated, uh, headline performs better than the human generated headline and like AB testing of, and this is across multiple customers. So you're starting to see, um, you know, where we're taking the analytics of what we know of content performance and then marrying that with that editorial process. Right now, we're just making people faster, more accurate and creating more robust content so that you're not compromising on all the like tedious, the tedium, tedious things that goes um, into that. We're not in the world right now of creating a bunch of tools that are suddenly saying like, oh, the editors, the the, the human, let's get the human out of the loop. Uh, let's just write all these things. We'll put it out in the world. All your Olympics coverage can come, you know, via AI. You don't have to do any of these things. We're not, we're not saying that's even the realistic state um, in the coming years. We're saying, look, we want an editor and a human in the loop. How do you um, really make that person faster, more effective and focusing on the value um, that humans provide in a lot of this stuff, not not just the tedious tasks of content production that I'm sure you can relate to deeply is for every podcast you you put out, how many little checklist items do you have as you get that thing, um, you know, onto your website and onto various platforms, et cetera. It's a lot of tedious activity. So AI is, you know, immensely helpful for our customers there. Yeah, 100% with you. And if we've got a business leader or entrepreneur listening, they might be the cautious type that are sitting on the fence right now, not quite understanding it. Or equally, they might be somebody looking for those superpowers you were just talking about. Are there any examples of some of the AI-powered features that assist WordPress as VIP clients in 
uh, generating more engaging, more personalized content experiences and, and hitting that sweet spot and getting those those big hits or viral hits on their websites. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, examples of how to use it or exa- like just give them an example of where well, it's where it's happened? Yeah, or some of the features. And uh, I think very often that we get distracted by some of those shiny features and, and not the value add or the impact that it can have. Is any of those features how they stand out or any measurable impact people have had from using them? Yeah. So I, like uh, like one of the things I had mentioned was just around like, uh, again, like a headline creation process where yeah. um, where that is something where, you know, we have seen both A-B testing and uh, of of these approaches, human generated, AI generated, and then which performs better and which performs better is purely around what drives more traffic, what drives more engagement. So typical engagement metrics on the web is how that's being measured against. And so, and we're seeing things like performance there, but we also know that like robust tagging and categorization of content also really helps in how do you relate things together and actually bring together an experience that is, um, that, that helps a user want to continue on beyond that first click. Um, many of our customers will talk about like, I don't really care about that first page view, because I mean, I've already gotten you on that one. What I want to know is, can I get you to look at another one sort of thing? And can I actually get you to stay engaged? And and by more robust and actually more accurate relationships between particularly large volumes of content, this is one of the things that like we'll see a lot in our customer base is you've got millions potentially of pieces of content you need to relate. And so this helps get more accurate in that. And we do see a lift uh, in the um, in the engagement, whether that's in additional page views or time on site um, is typically something that folks will look at pretty deeply on our um, customer base. So um, so we're seeing engagement or we'll, we're seeing those metrics um, also move there. Uh, the other aspect of this is just reduced time to publish. Um, we've seen folks take minutes off of time to publish and they will um, like measure these types of things against various setups and say, like, all right, in this context, it takes me 11 minutes to produce something fully in the editor. Now I've rolled these things out. I'm seeing that happen in eight minutes in cases, and you'll see reduction in time to do that, which again has a business value in are you like earlier to market, which gets you more traffic potentially, or are you just able to do more um, in a given period of time, which hopefully more equates to, um, you know, more outcomes on the other end of these things. Um, and so, and we are seeing those things it, um, with our customers in doing that. And all of, and I say all of that, and I say like all of that's still really early days for us because it's kind of just scratching the surface at like, okay, it's helping me do a lot of the tedious things that I've already done. And it's, yes, it's helping me take less time. That's great. But like, where is all this really going? Like, um, in doing this and, and one of the things we haven't done with this isn't our customers don't have the ability to do this yet. Um, and I guess somebody else can now go work on this and, and copy this idea. It's fine. Um, it, but is, um, there's immense value in um, the uh, authority that um, your content repository already has. So if you've got articles or you've got things you've created, they might have high authority on like a Google or whatever, where it drives a lot of traffic. And so typically links from that to something else also then get a lot of uh, a higher amount of authority and it helps drive more traffic and content relationships. So essentially you're backlinking your most authoritative content extremely tedious kinds of work to go back into your content archives, identify that stuff, set up those links and drive that to new content you're creating. Um, this is something we're all look, we're looking at doing in a fully automated fashion. So as you create a new piece of content, we could look across an entire network of content and say, Oh, you wrote about this over here. You wrote about this over here. You wrote, and we know it has, you know, higher authority because we have that, um, information on hand. We're going to go into that content and actually update links in that content to newer pieces of content to make it more authoritative and drive more users to that particular piece of content right now. And that will have a measured, measurable impact on search engine relevancy, et cetera. Um, this is not released yet. And, and, and this is still something, but this is something we're really excited that comes together because we have the rich content analytics living alongside of the CMS where all the content actually lives. Um, so those are the kinds of things I'm also excited about to come in the next year um, that I think will be very valuable. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. You just blown my mind there. Someone with 3,000 podcast interviews. On oh, stop. With <laughs> some of the biggest uh, names out there. And I, I'll be honest with you, as you just said, it's too tedious, that stuff. I've got very little interest in doing it, the benefits would be huge, but I haven't got time to to sit down and do all that stuff. So no, that, that's something that I'd be 
uh, greatly interested in. And it's important to mention as well that it is AI is a tool, not a replacement, and a tool that can help you get further along, but it can't just replace the content creation, etc. There's a lot of uh, instance I'm reading at the moment, such as the Google algorithm, uh, penalizing websites that create nothing but 100% AI written content. And this is the problem with plagiarism, which we've all talked about to death. So how are you at WordPress VIP ensuring that that authenticity, that trustworthiness of all these sites and the content that they publish on their platform remains? Yeah, the, this is an interesting... Well, I would say uh, from... You know, to be honest about our business or real, you know, we work um, with tend what tends to be large scale organizations. So, you know, we're not we we're, we're not just a social we're not a social platform that yeah. tends to just have kind of individuals and uh, and the and so our ability to really vet and understand who is leveraging our technology and um, uh, is is higher than most um, uh, organizations because of just the customer base we work with. And so then what extends from that is you've got, you know, uh, large media companies, et cetera, that have journal that have ascribed to journalistic standards and ethics and understand and have committed to, uh, you know, there, there, there is a process and a craft to what they're publishing, um, on the web. And so in a lot of cases, like what our platform is enabling is actually highly reputable media organizations that can t- tend to be, uh, viewed as like the source of fact. That have actually been the organizations that have been quite worried about, oh, what's training these uh, models in the first place? It's like, turns out to be a lot of our customer base has been like, what has been helping train those potentially? And so our customers are much more on the line of like, look, we're actually the ones that are um, the source of many facts uh, that end up being associated. How do we protect that? How do we think about like protecting our own businesses, et cetera? And, you know, uh, our, the, our customers, those are, you know, you've, there's plenty that has been covered recently in different media companies, striking partnerships and deals with, um, the various AI platforms and companies to, um, for fair use of their content in doing those things. But we also do everything we can to help them, uh, discourage, uh, different things from crawling, uh, their websites potentially and training these models. And so we are trying to help and like, how can we help protect you in the fair use? How can we alert you potentially if there are bots crawling and doing this? How could you then use that as a signal to maybe go and talk to one of these groups and say, Hey, uh, good. so we're, we're trying to help in that regard. And then I think in the world of fact, the, the, the sad state of the web is that like when, when we've gone out and surveyed folks, we've asked, you know, where would you like to get your news? And folks, like a, a large percentage, more than half of folks will say, I would love to go to highly reputable news sources for like content. And then that same group will also say, but I really just use social to get a lot of like my news and things like that. And you've got this like really painful, uh, you know, uh, tension there between these things. And the reality of that is that because so many media experiences and a lot of these places where you actually would go to learn about something more deeply, the experiences have been terrible. Uh, they have been littered with, uh, you know, ads and, 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 and content partnerships that mislead you and distract from the overall experience. I mean, we've created these really unfortunate web experiences in many cases in an attempt to extract whatever revenue we could from those types of things. And what that does is that disincentivizes the reader from actually wanting to spend time on the site. So we want to work with organizations and say, how do you create better experiences? The web is your website, your apps. These are something you own and can be really amazing experiences. And the platforms have shown us all that if you create great engaging experiences, people will stay there and make habits out of coming back to you, et cetera. So we're really trying to think, how can we help organizations, um, build better experiences for their audiences. It's within their control to do those things. Um, because I do think, you know, we are in this moment of a platform shakeup, honestly, where you're seeing all of the sort of fighting around social platforms and, you know, who, what users are where and, uh, ad safety and brand safety. And are we going to show media content at all or not? And, um, and so there's lots of tension in these things. There's concerns around, is Google even going to drive traffic to me anymore? Because they're just going to put an AI response in front of the user. And now I'm never going to see the actual click. And so much of what has to underpin the solution to many of these things is what is the experience you're giving your own audience? What is the experience you're giving your own users? How do you incentivize a habit for them to want to come back and actually um, 
come to you directly as opposed to relying on so much of the referral audience that um, we've all become addicted to over decades um, in this current paradigm. That's a lot of what we're thinking about there. And it becomes this counter balance to go back to your question on, you know, this, where could I find misleading AI generated content? Largely, it's going to be in these big open platforms where you're not sure what you can trust and where can you become more attached to fair, hopefully potentially unbiased, or at least fact check journalism, et cetera, you know, with a lot of these organizations that actually ascribe to those things, but there needs to be an experience there that incentivizes you to want to actually engage with them and do those things. Um, so that's where we think we have a responsibility to help folks. So how can you create better experiences and sustainable businesses behind those experiences? And on an extension on that, I'm curious, have you developed any AI-based tools to help clients build and maintain their own consumer trust? Is there any any tools you can share there or, or things that you're working on possibly? Yeah, there are. Some, so there's there's some interesting things here. And this is where I would plug like part, the beauty of automatic in in a way is, you know, there's a, there's other subsidiaries that focus more on like the small and the individual or the SMB up to mid-market kind of users. And so um, there's a lot of experiments um, and early products that are doing a lot of the um, experience building around, um, you know, help me build an experience that creates a form and has these fields or whatever else that you can just do more prompt based um, uh, building of web experiences in general. And so a lot of these things are happening now in the consumer side of the business. And I think they will graduate up into more of like what we're doing on the enterprise side as we kind of bring those use, use cases together. Um, you can test some of this stuff using um, a product we run here at Automatic called Jetpack. There's a, there's a way you can install that if you're already using WordPress. And you can actually get a lot of these AI content creation and um, superpowers um, by leveraging that um, as part of your WordPress use today. And so you can... Um, as that's why I was saying, like, I think there's a lot of this stuff that's already accessible to folks. Um, if they're already in the WordPress ecosystem where you can use and try this stuff. And then what we'll do is we continue to take that stuff and really tailor it, um, for enterprises. But the things we kind of, we think about on the VIP side are like, how would we take stuff like where people are doing a lot of work in Figma, for example, how would we take stuff out of Figma and make that like a one-to-one -one relationship behind, between like what you're comping and creating there and how do you just easily pull that into WordPress and make that um, a seamless experience? Um, those, How do you take content from a lot of disparate sources and just bring that all into a nice to easy to use experience? Um, those are a lot of the challenges we're solving right now and AI will help us do some of those things um, as we go along the way. And as we've said multiple times, I think it is this tool that can take away those tedious, horrible tasks that when they're put together, they can really move the needle there. And it's not about replacing humans. So I've got to ask, I mean, when it comes to balancing efficiency and the human touch when uh, looking into AI-powered content and the approach around that, is, is that something that's important to you as well to ensure that you get that right balance? A very. Um, it was, I think a lot of this is, I think it's going to be context dependent in terms of like, what's that balance per organization, for example, on, on how you get those things right. Um, I think from our perspective, the thing we've always, you know, we're talking about AI right now. If you and I had met 15 years ago, we would be talking about mobile and the entire upending of display rendering on a br desktop browser as we know it. And what's that going to mean? And you know, we were talking about responsive trends and, you know, all of these things around and, and what's WordPress's role going to be in a world where people are on their mobile phones and things. So we see a lot of the, you, we've, we've all, we're, we're, <laughs> we've lived long enough to go through a lot of these different uh, changes and, and shifts over the years. And so we, you know, we look at AI and what's this balance of people in there is just another one of these moments here where it's like, it's a good moment to be self-critical and think, did I really like doing this stuff in the first place? <laughs> and then think about what else could I be doing with my time if I wasn't doing those things? Like, I think there's so much that we, we, there's, there's, there's things to be concerned about in terms of, um, uh, what you described, which is like, look, if we just turn this loose and say, create a bunch of low value content, um, what's, what state does that leave, you know, the experience in? It's a pretty sad state. However, so we don't want that end of the extreme, uh, on this, but on the other end of this, it's like, look, um, as, uh, as a writer, as a creator, as, um, a business owner, you know, what are the things that you're uniquely suited to, to do? 
um, and how can you focus on those? And we we don't just see this in content creation with when it comes to AI. We see this on the developer side too. It's like how much of a technology stack do you really want to manage? For example, like do you really want to be managing lower level architectures of uh, at server levels and things like this, or would you rather just adopt like a cloud based technology that allows you to not have to worry about those things and then just focus on your unique business challenge in those things. And then that gives the existing team just much more leverage to actually focus on the business needs as opposed to keeping the lights on. So, so much of this balance will be like, look, I can focus less on just the mundane, how do I keep the lights on tasks? And actually we can refocus the discussion on like, how do we actually create more value given this new context we live in, which is to say that like, you know, these large language models um, are pretty darn good at returning text in certain ways. And if that's the case, then like, or, you know, any sort of um, uh, content, uh, how can I now leverage that and go focus on something else? So the balance should always swing in the direction of business value instead of just like, oh, no, I just do this because that's my job. And I that that that's always been my job. And now I'm threatened because that's no longer my job. It's like, no, no, no. Like, how would you now create more value? You've, you've got other, you've got a higher calling than tagging content yeah. or writing the perfect headline. Like, that's okay. You can focus on something else now. 100%. And another positive change I would say is large enterprises in particular are all about making data-driven decision-making rather than just the loudest voice in a meeting room. So can you explain how WordPress VIP, your leading to data-driven insights and how they're helping content creators make those more informed data-driven decisions. Because again, hugely important right now, isn't it? No one wants to create content that nobody's going to see. It needs to be data-driven, right? That's it. Um, and so, we, so, you know, for context, we have, we have a, uh, the CMS side, the WordPress CMS side of our, of our business, which is, has been the core since the early days of automatic uh, we also have a content analytics solution. It's called Parsley that our customers leverage. Um, and um, and it's a content analytics dashboard. If you've worked with other analytics prod- products that have either been offered by Adobe or Google or others over the years, it's in that vein of how do you um, take analytics and then help that inform the work that you're doing. So um, uh, one of the core things that you know we push with our customers is you're going to be able to move faster. We we did, we talked about this earlier. Where it's like, oh, I've taken publishing time down from 11 minutes to whatever. And so, or now I can do it in one minute and now I can do it a hundred times a day or something like that. And that's great. Now you can move more quickly, but what's important is also like, is does move quickly also equate to additional results? Because it may be something where you're actually just putting more into the machine, but you're not getting it. It's like, you're putting more gas in the engine, but you're not getting any more output uh, to it. It's just, running hot. So we want to make sure that folks understand um, what's working and what's not. And actually the interesting thing when we had that same survey where we had asked like, Hey, how important and where's AI falling for you in use? You know, it was very important was I think around 15% in this uh, group. Uh, 45% said like my analytics dashboard is very important to me right now. So there's still this aspect of like, look, I like the new tools and the excitement around that. However, in my day to day, I need to know what's working and what's not. And like, that's the stuff that's still like vastly important to me. So, and the beauty of that is that all of that stuff comes together. As I said earlier, you can actually take a lot of the analytics and the data and what you understand to be working. And you can just feed that back into the recommendation uh, side of what's generated. Um, And then you start to get to this, um, you know, beautiful world where actually you don't even need the dashboard anymore. Um, so what we've been doing and what, where we really tend to focus on this is how do you take the point at which you're creating content, where all of your creativity is going and how do we surface it in context, performance and understanding so that you have right in front of you, a lot of, um, the analysis around, um, you know, engagement, page time, time spent, et cetera, what's trending, all of these things right there with you as you're creating content so that that can help inform how you're building things as opposed to switching between contexts. The other aspect of this is that we've built um, some content analytics products that are very, um, they are very uh, focused on the content creator use case, which means um, they lower the bar. They, they're more accessible to just more folks. So you don't need to be a data scientist in order to just like build and understand 
uh, how analytics is working in your business. So much in the same way that WordPress reduces the bar to en- the barrier to entry on content creation and engaging on the web, we want to do the same thing on the analytics side. Like how do we bring, how do we lower the bar to entry on analytics so that folks aren't sitting there thinking like, am I looking at the right thing? Is this even the right signal? Am I being misled? And what I'm potentially um, gleaning from these insights or anything else, how do we simplify a lot of that and make that more approachable? Um, Because what we do find is that when more folks can get their hands on the tools, great things happen in that case. And so we're constantly thinking, how do we um, make things more accessible to more people to actually do that work? So, So that's some of the thinking around data. Love it. And looking to the future, I was recently talking with my son who found himself in a a sticky situation abroad, not knowing how to get a bus from A to B or something like that. And he said, Dad, I went on to Google and I tried to Google my way out of this, as you do. And uh, he he had a whole page of irrelevant information, sponsored ads and everything. But then when he turned to, it was either ChatGPT or Claude and asked the same question, he got the information he needed instantly. So now he searches for answers that way. And yeah, there were problems with doing that which i had a bit of a debate with him about but it's just got me thinking about the future you know if people start leaning towards that for searching for things what does this mean is is seo going to be different or even dead in the future but i'm I'm curious what ai driven content creation trends are you seeing are you having similar conversations and and how are you preparing for a different future of the web and how people access information. I mean, you were talking about the news. Some people prefer to get it on social. Some people, the the website. There's just so much going on in this space, isn't there? Yeah. The um, I mean, it's interesting if we all just like think and we're a bit self-critical around how we think about things like SEO and what that does. A lot of how we think about how do I create something that's search engine optimized that might not also be customer optimized. And so, yeah. um, so there 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 is an interesting dynamic where because there's an understanding of the importance of referrers, such as a search engine, and then what we understand in terms of what they like and how, and what they will preference, we try to play those games. Honestly, like there's just an aspect of playing those games. And so there's a part of me that actually celebrates the fact, like maybe we just have to stop thinking that we can play a game to drive traffic. Because to your point, that search engine result that was largely meaningless was probably also the product of people playing a game where by some way they had loaded that up with um, results that, you know, either through sponsored content or something else came back um, that way. And it was of low value. And so I think in those experiences, those were a harbinger for there's going to be a change here. And so there is a part of me that says, uh, great, I'm glad for there to be um, a, uh, a, a change here because the search engine optimized sponsored content and everything else game doesn't really create um, great user experiences on the other end of this. And so if if now it's a moment for business leaders to take a pause and say, hey, what are we doing now? How are we going to rethink this? Cert- being SE, you know, search engine optimized isn't going away anytime soon, by the way. Like this is still, this, the realities of referral traffic and all of that are still alive and well. So I don't think it's changing anyhow. But I think if we have to ask ourselves the question again of like, okay, Again, if there's a query that gets dropped somewhere and there's a great response and it doesn't kind of follow the 10 blue link paradigm into the future, then how do we need to rethink that um, into um, the future? And look, I'm not a great predictor, uh, you know, uh, on like how actually does that look? Because I actually think if you try to carry that forward as a prediction in terms of what happens, maybe someone would tell you like, look, the website's irrelevant. Uh, It's going away. Um, Possibly, I don't. I don't tend to buy into those uh, t- that type of like doomsday um, sort of assessment. But I actually think what, how does user behavior change um, is going to be an interesting thing to see unfold. And I think the the important thing is to be really dialed into how this is changing, and then being ready yourselves to adapt to how consumption changes. So that if Google does introduce or a, 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 any platforms introduce AI powered responses to things. How are you then taking that into context as it relates to what it drives for you in referral traffic or user behaviors? And then how are you going to adapt your own product in that paradigm into the future? That is going to be very dependent on each organization and each, um, uh, in each situation. Um, the beauty though is that like, and, and what I lean into on the, um, when we think about this from the WordPress VIP context is that a lot of how WordPress 
and our CMS and our relationship to the web comes about is that it's built around the fundamentals of how the open web even exists. So kind of going back to the open standard of 1990, like it's amazing to think that a lot of like how we experience things like the web today is really just built on top of a few very simple um, protocols uh, that were established 40, uh, almost 40 years ago now, crazy, uh, to think 35, 34 years ago um, on that. And I think we actually lose sight of some of that in terms of it's like all of this works because of like a few things that actually nobody owns, right? It's like these, these, these protocols are free for all of us to use and they work and it's magical and they're very resilient and adaptable. They've shown themselves to do that for 35 years. So as organizations, it's like, how are we prepared to take advantage and to adapt via um, things like the web and these owned channels that we have as organizations? Um, and that's where like focusing on the new challenges becomes so important. So I don't know what the future of like the website looks like relative to uh, an AI response showing up in a search engine. But what I can tell you is that great experiences on the web will end up informing the the source of truth for these things. Like the truth has to come from somewhere uh, in all of this. And many of these organizations are providing that truth and their relationship to then the audience and the customer on the other end largely depends on how well they treat that audience with their own products that they've developed. And I would just say many of us have not treated the users all that well in some of the experiences we've developed. So I think it's a great opportunity to like invest in that and improve that and not necessarily trust that, you know, oh, this platform is 70% of my traffic today and it will always be that way. Like I do think there has been this um, just assumption that, hey, um, it's kind of always been this way with maybe a search engine referral. Um, and it will always be that way into the future. It's like, no, actually, it's a great reminder. It won't be. This um, could change at any moment. And so how do you focus on what you control um, in this? And how do you stay tuned into that? And so a lot of that, again, gets back to like making sure you're focusing on the new and unique challenges into the future, not necessarily rebuilding a CMS or rebuilding you know underlying technologies that are solved challenges, honestly, out in the market. And you can focus on the new and novel challenges that will inevitably be there uh, in the world. Wow, that was absolutely beautifully answered. And I think it's a powerful moment to end on. But so many food for thought there. But before I let you go, for anyone listening wanting to find out more information about WordPress VIP, explore some of the topic that we discussed today, or contact you or your team, where would you like to point everyone listening? Oh, my gosh. Uh, you can just go to WPVIP.com and you can find all that stuff there. I'm easily found everywhere. My name's Nick Gurner. I, there's not a lot of Nick Gurners out there in the world. Um, so you can find me if you just Google. I'm not hard to find. Every uh, I think every sales rep has my phone number. So just ask your sales reps if somebody wants to get in touch. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will add links to everything to make sure people can find you nice and easily as well. And we covered so much from ensuring website security across the, is across the entire web ecosystem. And there's the big talking point of the day, the hero of the hour, the impact of AI, what it's having on web content that we read every day and how that is going to evolve so much food for thought. And I'm hoping that a lot of businesses will find it as equally as valuing as I did today. So thanks for sharing it with me today. Yeah, thank you, Neil. This was so much fun. As AI continues to influence the way content is created and consumed, how can businesses ensure that they leverage these tools effectively while preserving the essential human touch? Well, Nick at WordPress VIP has given us valuable insights into how to strike that balance and navigate the future of digital experiences. But what steps will you take to adapt to these changes and enhance your content strategy? Email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Let me know your thoughts. Other than that, it's time for me to prepare for another guest who's going to be joining us tomorrow. So thank you for listening today. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Don't be a stranger.